Winfield, and of course Wheaton, and the Mc Robert McCormick House located at Cantini Park in Wheaton. I'm Judy Beaver, the president of the Wheaton League. I'd like to introduce first Cheryl Gravy, who will be giving us some Zoom logistics. Cheryl currently serves as the national organizer for NICD, which is the National Institute for Civil Discourse, working with communities and partner organizations to foster civil discourse capacity and help bridge political divides through online and in-person NICD programs. Prior to joining NICD, she served as the Senior Director of Field Support for the League of Women Voters of the United States, and she is a longtime proud member of the League. Um, NICD was created in 2011 by the University of Arizona to promote healthy and civil political debate after the tragic Tucson shooting that injured Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. NICD believes that American people will be our saving grace as we are hungry for a more constructive approach to politics. In addition to inspiring and organizing everyday Americans, NICD's strategy is designed to encourage elected leaders to put country ahead of partisanship. Cheryl? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Judy, and uh, I'm sure many or most of you have probably been on many Zoom meetings over the last number of uh, weeks and last couple of months. Um, so I just, you know, the chat on the bottom where you've been typing in uh, where you're from, we appreciate and we'll invite you to use that in response to a question that Carolyn's going to ask you at some point during the session and also as a place to share some of your thoughts and questions during the session. Um, we'll have an opportunity, we'll have a couple of times where Barbara will help us uh, facilitate a question and answer session to Carolyn. And to do that, we're going to uh, ask a number of you to, you know, just raise your hands and the first five or so will we'll open up and uh, take your questions. In order to do that, how many of you, let's, let's try it quickly. Uh, if you click on that little participant on the, also on the bottom middle of your screen, you'll see, you should see on the right hand side, a panel that'll come up with your name. And let's try and see if you can just raise your hand. Just practice and let's see if, yeah, there we go. Yay, all right, everybody. <laughs> all right, excellent. Uh, then if you go ahead and lower your hand now. Um, but that's what we'll use. And then the first few folks, uh, we'll look for either questions in the chat or, or take some of you uh, live for the question and answer uh, section. Um, then we, we also have, we're going to ask you, encourage you to stay muted and until you're talking uh, because that just helps us avoid background noise. We are recording this and we'll send the recording to the Wheaton League and the Illinois State League and then also uh, we'll send out the recording to those of you who've been part of our kind of a civil discourse league mm -hmm. uh, collaborative uh, afterwards. And we will be doing some breakout rooms as part of this. We'll be doing one session where we'll put you into small breakouts and we'll give you some instructions to listen for before we send you into those breakout rooms. So I think with that, that should hopefully uh, folks feel comfortable with uh, Zoom and I will turn this uh, back over to, to Judy. Thanks, Cheryl. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Carolyn J. Lukensmeyer, was the first executive director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse, an organization that works to reduce political dysfunction and incivility in our political system, as I stated before. Um, as a leader in the field of deliberative democracy, she works to restore our democracy to reflect the intended vision of our founding fathers. Dr. Lukensmeyer previously served as founder and president of America Speaks, an award-winning nonprofit organization that promoted nonpartisan initiatives to engage citizens and leaders through the development of innovative public policy tools and strategies. During her tenure, America Speaks engaged more than 200,000 people and hosted events across all 50 states and throughout the world. 
Dr. Lukensmeyer formally served as consultant to the White House Chief of Staff from 1993 to 94, and on the National Performance Review, where she steered internal management and oversaw government-wide reforms. She was the Chief of Staff to Ohio Governor Richard F. Celeste from 1986 to 91, becoming the first woman to serve in this capacity. She earned her PhD in organizational behavior at Case Western Reserve University and has completed postgraduate training at the Gustav Institute of Cleveland. I had the privilege to hear Dr. Lukensmeyer at the US convention um, this past June, and we want to thank Barb Wymans for getting her to come to speak to us. So please welcome Dr. Lukensmeyer for presenting What Will It Take to Rebuild Our Civic Trust to save our democracy. Judy and Barbara, thank you very much for inviting me to be with the Illinois League members and other people from the League who have joined the call this evening. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. And I am always excited and ready to talk about what it will take to rebuild trust in our society because you really cannot have a working democracy when trust in institutions and trust between people gets as low as it has gotten in our country. We haven't crossed a, a, a line from which we cannot come back, but I'm sure each of you would have your own indicators over the last couple of decades of how obvious it is that trust in government, trust in media, trust in institutions, actually the Gallup poll on trust for a couple of decades showed that decline in institutions was happening in everything except interpersonal relations. And in the last poll they did, we've dropped below 50% in terms of how much we actually trust each other. So it is a critical issue in our society. And I think the League is very well positioned both locally and nationally to play a leadership role in what it will take to reestablish the trust necessary in any culture, but particularly for a democracy to function and thrive. There are two levels on which I think we have to look at the issue of trust. One is systemic structural issues that have really helped degrade our trust. And the other are the cultural behavioral side. And many times people argue about well, is what's happened in campaign finance reform, if we're talking about our, the state of our democracy or in gerrymandering. So they look at the structural issues and think that's all that matters. Whereas other people focus on, no, we really have to, every single one of us, look at how we are carrying unconscious racism or lack of understanding of our white privilege. So focusing on the cultural behavioral side. Well, to really rebuild trust in any context, whether that's a family context or an organizational context or in our country, we have to deal with both the structural issues and the cultural behavioral issues. Historically speaking, it is often the structural issues that eventually erode the trust. Because if you cannot feel confidence if you just take today's news, we watched once again the CDC director and the president of the country say two very different things about when vaccine will be available and in fact who will get that vaccine in what time frame. So these are two very, very powerful positions in the structure that all of us expect to have confidence in. And when you're receiving a mixed signal at that level, it by definition erodes your trust in the government itself. The hyperpartisanship that started in Congress in the late 70s and increased from there actually was very much centered first just in Washington, where it built up an increasing inability for real relationships and trust across the aisle amongst members of Congress, and that has only really gotten worse and particularly been intensified since 2016, but it, it was with us long before that. 
But in the last 10 to 15 years, what was centered in our politics in Washington has now literally become like a virus crossing the country. So it's in our communities, in businesses, in churches, in our families. So that's where it becomes increasingly a matter of how we behave with each other. So I no longer am willing to have a conversation with this person because of their beliefs about the wall or because I know they voted for Hillary or whatever the example might be. And when we think about trying to reverse this, and I know that's the energy that the, civic, the civility initiative inside the league has, what are the actions we can take that actually could do something to change the direction, to reestablish trust? I wanna share, I worked for several years in the federal government, in the management side, as well as the political, the, in terms of the White House side. And I learned this from a gentleman in the Fish and Wildlife Service who had done really difficult conflict resolution things, whether that was how the salmon were running in Oregon or whether it was water distribution in the four southwestern states. And he had a saying that I thought really actually grabbed this issue of the challenge of rebuilding trust. That trust is, once trust is broken, it only is rebuilt thimbleful by thimbleful. It can be broken in one fell swoop, like a ton of bricks, but rebuilding it, we have to have new experiences with each other that allow us to take a step back toward actually understanding that our ability to respect each other across the difference is what really can establish trust in the long run in our culture. So, <coughs> excuse me, because this is gonna come up later in the evening, I'm gonna ask you all to take a minute to jot something in the chat room, which will enable Cheryl and a couple of other people to start reading it and look for some themes. So this may seem out of phase in terms of how I've been talking about systemic structural trust and behavioral cultural trust, but it'll come full cycle at, by the end of our evening together. Just put in the chat room what you feel most helpful about, hopeful about around the election of 2020. And just, just a phrase or a quick word or two, what you feel most hopeful about for the 2020 election. And then the flip side of that coin, what do you feel most fearful about of the 2020 election? And I know most of us could write paragraphs about both of those at this moment in time. But if you can, just a phrase that captures your strongest hope about the election and your largest fear about the election. And we'll come back to that later in our conversation. Hey, and Carolyn, as you're doing that, folks, if you would put hope and then your answer or fear and then your answer, it'll help us kind of look at because you might be helpful about voting in person or you may be fearful about that. So thanks for doing that. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah. And I, partly I wanted to bring up the 2020 election because at the moment, the issue of trust in terms of our democracy is right down at the level of the integrity of our vote. The percentage of Americans that do not have confidence that their vote will be recorded as they registered it or as they pulled the lever is a shocking percentage. And that is new in our country. We have not seen that level of concern in the integrity of my individual vote. That's one level in which the trust issue is working. And the other is the issue of, okay, we have the election, given the amount of mail-in that's going to occur, we're not going to know the night of the third who won. And as the time is extended in terms of getting all the mail votes counted, what will take place in that period that potentially could undermine the actual outcome of the election? So I think particularly there are many ways to focus on where the trust issue is the heart of the matter at the moment. But certainly in our democracy, the issue of the integrity of our own vote process. Dan Coates, 
a recent person who was in charge of all of the intelligent world in the Trump administration has actually just written a proposal to Congress asking them to create a commission, a bipartisan commission that will play the role of monitoring at the national level the integrity of the vote. So I think at this exact moment in time, this issue of trust has moved right into the center of what we care most about in terms of our government and our belief in we the people, our belief that people are capable of self-governing. So I can't think of any more important time for a group like the League, as well as hundreds of other civic entities, to focus on this issue of how do we rebuild trust. Now, most of us know that as individuals, or even as a collective chapter of the League, we can't play the role that a bipartisan commission can play on the big picture about what happens on the November election. So I always talk with people about, bring it back to your place in your community. All of us are in circles, lots of circles in our lives. Our personal family circles, our personal friend circles, our personal book club circles, and whatever those places are that you have standing with a group of people. And for some of you who've held elective office or in, in politics and or in the league, you know having a circle that's extended much larger than a smaller circle. But my counsel to you, even as I'm talking, when you think about the places that you are now most concerned about trust that touch your own life immediately, the places that you could take a stand, that you could speak your view or your truth about these issues, to begin to think about how those are the places in your life that some of the principles we talk about tonight, both at the cultural behavioral level and at the structural systemic level, are places that you actually could take action currently between the, now and the election and post the election. So even take a note, minute and jot yourself a note about those places because as I'm giving examples, it may lead you to develop some specific questions. Okay, Carolyn, if I'm gonna do that between two congregations in my community, one that tends to be more liberal and one that tends to be more conservative, this is the question I wanna ask you about how to structure that. So my invitation to you to think about that already in our evening is to hopefully make this most valuable to you in terms of gaining the most sense of how it's possible to help people cross the divides. Does that make sense to all of you? Okay, great. So I don't know, my suspicion is that I should make the shift to what you can do on the personal and community level and the organizational level in terms of this part of our evening. My guess is you each all have enough examples of where the trust is broken that you don't need me to be re repeating those. Is that a safe assumption on my part? So let's talk first on a personal, personal level. One thing I ask people about is we're living in a time when we've all been almost battered by mass media information and social media to a place that most of us come to a place where we say, I just, I, I can't take this. I, I, I don't want any more of this. And we find ourselves saying things like, no, I'm, I'm not, okay, I'll, I'll give a personal example. Well, I'm leading the National Institute for Civil Discourse. My own circle of friends in Washington, D.C., many of them, like myself, have held very powerful positions in government. They would literally say to me, Carolyn, we know what you're doing is so important, but I'm not going to have a conversation with somebody who voted for Trump. So one of the things is just a little quick self-reflection. Are there categories of people in your own life that you have chosen for whatever reason to not be willing to make the attempt to cross that divide. And I gave an example of my friendship circle. Many of us could give examples of our family circles where we know Uncle John is gonna go off at Thanksgiving dinner and if we get into a political discussion, it's not gonna be much fun. 
So again, my counsel to you is to, okay, where in my own life do I feel the readiness, the support, the willingness to step out and really engage with someone who I know has significant different policy perspectives than my own or different ideological place on the continuum. And one of the things you may wanna do, and it's, it's difficult to do, but rewarding if you can create a safe space, is pick someone in your own life who you know there'd be high reward if you got back on track with how you share and talk, and there's some risk in starting the conversation. So it is really thinking through, what do I need to feel safe enough to be in this conversation? And what questions do I need to ask the other person to see if they feel safe enough to be in that conversation? Now, many of you may have begun to feel impatient and say, wait a minute, I don't wanna do this in my interpersonal life. I wanna do this around the big choice facing us in the country which is the divide we have on immigration, the divide we have on climate change, the divide we're gonna all vote on in November. So let me go there and actually give a few principles. And those of you who were on the earlier call, this will sound familiar. The very most important thing, if you're gonna create a conversation for a group of people, however small, two, four, eight, who are on different sides of these important issues. The number one thing to set a ground that will create enough safety is that for this conversation tonight, we are only working to understand one another. We're agreeing up front. None of us are gonna to try to influence each other to come around to our point of view. That's one of the things the internet and social media has done. It's put people almost all the time in a broadcast mood, in a I want you to hear what I'm saying and I wanna influence your thinking based on the facts as I know them. So principle number one, set the stage that as we come together for this conversation, we have one goal only, to leave it understanding how each of us has come to hold the position we've hold based on our own life experience. Sometimes that will be easy. And sometimes as a person is putting out, we did a lot of this in Arizona about the wall. And as you can easily imagine, many of the things that people quickly said about why they were for or against the wall were emotion filled, not fact based, and yet when we were doing the conversations around focusing on understanding, what we said was every time you hear someone say something that triggers you, that you, you know you disagree with that or you have a fact that proves what that's wrong, instead of responding, take a breath to get yourself rebalanced internally and ask another question. So the other person puts out more and more information about why they've come to feel like they feel. And what you'll find if that's working is the conversation gets left off talking, it moves off talking points, it moves off reciting the things that have been in the news, and it starts to become a sharing of personal experience. It starts to be, well, I actually knew a Brazilian landscaper who X, Y, and Z, or whatever the example might be. So that's principle number one. Another important thing to, and again, for most of us on things we feel strongly about at this point, and this will get even stronger as we go toward the election, is to approach the conversation where you can identify something you are curious about. One of the things that as you watch people who are fighting on these issues and not able to talk to each other, what you'll observe is they're not even slightly curious about each other's, where they come from or what their thought pattern is. So do the discipline, help people do the discipline about what am I curious about? And then coach people to start with an open mind. That's easier said than done. It's easier for most people to grab a kernel about curiosity than it is for them to all of a sudden commit to an open mind. But both are important. 
The other thing is change the percentage of time you're talking and the percentage of time you're listening. In some case, and you may want to try what I'm talking about first with just a pair of people. <coughs> and if you set it up as the pair, we actually can take turns. I'm going to listen to you and ask questions long enough until I actually understand your perspective. And then we're going to switch roles. You're going to listen to me long enough to actually understand how I came to hold the belief that I hold. If you're doing a little larger group, you're just going to have to, again, continually remind people that each of us should be monitoring that we're spending certainly as much time listening, but even better, a little more time listening than talking. Another thing, and again, I think it's the speed that we're all living our lives with and the multiple things fighting for our attention, but most people are really uncomfortable with moments of silence in a conversation. So that's one of the ground rules you want to set up too, which is as we're dealing with this very difficult situ conversation and issue that we're talking about, it's okay for there to be a gap in response to one another. It's okay for me to really stop and think about what you've just said rather than responding. We've gotten into conversational style in our country, whether it's react, 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 react when we're in these kinds of tough issues. And partly what we're asking people to do is something that did was more part of our behavior pattern in earlier times, which was to have a kind of rhythm to the conversation in terms of talking and listening, in terms of reflection and pushing. So get okay with moments of silence is one of the other things that we counsel people on pretty strongly. It also helps to increase your skill at noticing nonverbal cues. Even people who are being very aggressive about their position, sometimes if you watch carefully, what you'll see nonverbally is that they're actually very anxious. They're coming across verbally as aggressive attacking. And if you only are paying attention to the volume and the words, you start to take that in, which of course leads to defense. So try to have an eye out for nonverbal communication as well as what people are saying. So I've, Cheryl, you're gonna to have to help me with time. I, I, we started late. Do I have time to talk a little bit about what can be done in the community organization before we open it up for questions? Or uh, do if, we... you, if you go ahead and do that, maybe within about a minute or so, Carolyn, if that's possible. <laughs> sure, why not, why not? <laughs> All so, right. Let me shift in terms of when you're trying this in the context of an organization or a community event and what you're agreeing to in that context, and you may be doing it formally as a member of the league, that you're offering your capacity as a facilitator, as a leader, to actually facilitate some communications in a community or inside an organization. The first thing that's important to do in the organization is set the context. Why are we together? What do we want to come out of this? Since I haven't been part of your organization, if that's the case, what history do I need to know that I will just understand what you're bringing to the fore? You're not taking them into a historical conversation, but you're giving them the chance to teach you enough that you will know what the hotspots are and that can allow you, again, to put some boundaries in to set up this, this potential for actually listening to one another. What's different about this is we're not doing this just to figure out where we are personally, but we're doing this to figure out how do we as an organization actually move forward. I, what comes to mind is a call I got from a Lutheran pastor in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. And maybe I told the story in the early one. If I did, those of you who are there, I apologize. He'd been the pastor for 35 years. This, this congregation was really a community, a family. They did plays together. They took trips together. They, at the 2016 election, it split the congregation in terms of those who voted for Hillary and those who voted for Trump. And the congregation, they weren't sitting together. A lot of their community events stopped happening. So he called the National Institute to say, help me think through what can we do to actually open up again the, 
the members of the congregation's ability to sit together, problem solve, and move forward. So some of the kinds, that was a very dramatic situation. Some of the kinds of principles though that I'm sharing with you are exactly what we coached him to do. And in the, his, his case, which may be true in an organization that approaches you, we did strongly suggest an outside facilitator because he, the pastor, both sides had examples that proved to them that he was on their side of the aisle, so to speak. So that's a first assessment you wanna make if you're helping with a community meeting or inside an organization. Is there a leader in the organization who has enough neutral space around them that they can actually be the leader or do you or someone else you'd help break in need to be who establishes enough safety and enough initial ground rules that people begin to put their toe in the water of speaking authentically without fighting the old fight immediately when they begin to speak. In the interest of time, I hope that's been helpful and I will stop, but we do want to have some time for questions either about the interpersonal level or about the community and organizational level. Great, so for that, again, just a little instruction. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Barbara will help facilitate, but if, if those of you who have a question, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand. And we'll take about 10 minutes here. Uh, so go ahead and raise your hand or type it into the chat, but we'd like to hear your voices if possible. Don't tell me I've talked to you all. Thank you, Patty. Patty, I guess it is, but Barbara, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I have one question that struck home to me um, while other people are waiting to raise their hands is when you talked about the trigger points. I know that when I get into a conversation, I can feel myself physically tense up at certain comments. And do you have any tips as to how we can overcome that because it's the tension that wants me to give a Twitter response, short and curt. Yeah, I mean, it definitely happens. And we all know it, we all, it's different for different people in terms of how you physically, physiologically react, but your body does send you a signal. The unluckiest ones, our faces turn red, so everybody knows we've been triggered. But you'll know, you know in your own system. Rule, suggestion number one, take a couple of deep breaths. Literally, it is physiologically a phenomena that that process of a, and you don't have to be, you know, a big inhalation or deep, that it distracts everything, but just a good sized breath and then exhale it fully and do that a couple of times. And that will begin to reverse the physiological process that started in you that you got triggered by. So that's the critical thing. And then again, the, it, it's not true in every circumstance, but in a lot of the situations, the next best thing to do, if by definition it's important that you speak next, is ask a question. And ask a how or a why question. So you're getting more content out of that person's life experience. And then just pass by the content that actually triggered you at that moment. Because engaging with it will get, won't produce anything that moves to, toward the two of you understanding one another. Thank you. Carol Kersey has um, her hand raised. Carol, could you unmute yourself, please? I shall. Um, and thank you for the, the suggestion on the, uh, the, the, the personal uh, tips and techniques. My question is, do you have any, it's really uh, related to doing work with a group who can't stand each other, like they can't, can't be in the same room with each other without being positional, etc. Do you have any recommended resources or, or I'm looking for tips and techniques here that would, I think, take too long. I'm happy to research, but I just didn't know if you had any favorite 
resource. Yeah, and, in the, um, and Cheryl, you're more up to date on that. If, if you go to the NICD website, there is a resource section that literally, honest to goodness, Carol, my library, but for the seven years that I was in at NICD, in the early years, there were maybe five or six books that were focused directly on the issue of civility and what it takes to actually bring it back into specific places. Yeah. But at the end of the time, there are good ones for faith-based contexts. There are good ones for corporate contexts. Um, okay. Do you know cool. the author Brene Brown? She's yeah. got two books out that have great specific actions to take. Now, one thing I'd say to you, I don't know your context where people are, you said, at each other and just cannot speak to each other. Very often, when I was asked questions in large audiences, people would say, well, what, what about people who just are really rigid out there in their positions? And partly what I rare, very quickly say, if you look at the data, there's today probably about someplace between 10 to 15 percent of people on the far right that everything we're talking about tonight, you would just be like hitting your head on a brick wall and someplace between 10 to 12 on the far left. But that leaves 75% of us who mm -hmm. someplace in our own interior know that this issue of not being able to speak to one another because of who you voted for is fundamentally wrong. It's wrong as a human being and it's wrong in a democracy. So I would counsel you, don't put yourself in a position where people are so rigid that no matter what you do, nothing's gonna happen be working in those places where there's already the seeds inside yeah. the people of wanting to be someplace different. And what you're doing is providing a process that matches that seed. Yeah, I'm a coach and that's the first rule of coaching is only coach someone who's willing to be coached. <laughs> Makes sense, so thank doesn't you. it? Yes. Carolyn, that's great. Good. And thanks for the NICD uh, reference. Super. Cool. Carolyn, we have two questions in the chat. Irene is asking, is there a limit to the size of group that can participate in a civil conversation? How does Zoom affect the experience? I'm going to take those as two different questions. Um, the size issue is a function of what you're comfortable with. And each of you probably know that. We, we all, just how our eyes work in terms of perception how many people can you have some sense of where they are as a group if you're in the facilitator role? Um, I'll give myself as a personal example because I was really interested in going to scale and, it, and you have specific structures that help enable you to do this, but I'm quite comfortable doing what we're talking in groups of 500 or 1,000 people. But it's structured in a way that can support my leadership of holding a container that can hold that many people. But I'm not something you should aspire to be. That was the role I've been playing. If you know you can keep in your peripheral vision and get some sense of where people are verbally and non-verbally at a size of 10, then that's the size you should work in. So the size of the group depends on the comfort level you have about taking in data through all your senses, energetically as well as sight, and then you want to structure to support this. Now in Zoom calls, again, Zoom, Zoom has got some limitations on the platform in terms of the way in which you use the breakout groups. But so at Zoom, when you get up much more, I, I'm pretty comfortable doing 200 people if I have three hours, but I think like the group, the size we have tonight, where you can pretty much get everybody on the gallery view in one or two swipes of the computer is probably pretty easily managed if you're not in a high conflict situation. Zoom has not worked, Zoom is not yet in a context capable of dealing an embedded high conflict situation. There's a lot more I could say, but I hope that at least gets at a little bit, Irene. We'll take one more question. I know there's more questions in the Zoom, in the chat box, but I think some of them might be answered in the next segment. But this question I thought was really interesting from Lou in uh, Utica, New York. In the case of, say, racial justice, 
Would you suggest bringing people with similar identity together first to discuss their thoughts before putting people of color with them to shield people of color from really uninformed statements that could be very hurtful to them? That's a great question, Lou. And certainly in the current context that we're in, um, what a moment we're in in our, our history in the United States that the number of white people that are stepping up to be responsible about learning how white privilege has operated in their, in their lives and learning how racism is a cultural phenomena. It isn't just about, am I a racist or not a racist? There's a lot of good writing about this, Lou, that, that interestingly enough, can make the case both ways. There's an organization called Everyday Democracy that has been doing race conversations in deep ways for 30 years. I think if you looked at their website, you'd find some great resources there in terms of what are the circumstances under which you first want white people to be talking by themselves and then black people talking by themselves and then bring them to, bringing them together. There are other circumstances, and again, it's the design and the process where it's perfectly fine to actually start with everyone in the room, but just, just use structures that make it possible to ensure that unaware comments made by anyone in the room, but as you, rec as you noted, noted, more likely to be made by white people that would be hurtful to black people, just use the process to ensure that things go slow enough that that would get caught uh, as soon as it happens. So I, I would be cautious for anyone who puts out a blanket rule that it always has to be whites alone and blacks alone to begin with. It, it really depends on the context. There's a guy named David Campt. If you Google him, he's an African-American man that we worked with a lot at America Speaks and that worked on President Clinton's race initiative that has, for I think it's almost three years, been doing nothing but what he calls white ally workshops, where he works with workshops of only white people, black people are not involved in them at all, which creates the context and the openness needed for white people to go a lot deeper in terms of self-discovery of their unconscious racism or of their unintended comments that they can then learn how what the implications of that are. Again, I, everyday democracy would be great on resources in both directions and, and real research that's been done on the question that you've asked. Thank you. Oops, great. I think, uh, thank you, Barbara, for that. Thank you for Carolyn. Um, it strikes me, Carolyn, that maybe now we should, uh, before you go into this next uh, segment, maybe I could share a little bit about what people's hopes and fears were. Would you like me to, that makes sense? Sure. Okay. Yeah, it does. Great. So uh, maybe I'll start with the fears and I'll go to the hopes. <laughs> um, People have fears about sort of the daily chaos uh, emanating from the president and just in general. There's fears of, of violence. Uh, there's fears that challenge to the uh, to the results and people won't trust the outcome of the election. Um, it'll be close. Uh, that votes will not be counted. Um, there's fear that the electoral college will overturn the popular vote. There's fear of voter suppression. Um, and uh, that issues like climate change and other things that people care deeply about will be ignored. And then finally, uh, that maybe our democracy won't hold up uh, after all of this. Those are some of the fears. The hopes, um, fair amount of hope in young people and millennials and new voters being part of the, the process. There was hope about Black Lives Matter and the movements uh, growing uh, out of those efforts of organizing. There's hope in local leagues. Um, there's hope that there will be more more voters and biggest voter turnout ever. There's hope that change is coming. Um, people had hope with mail-in ballots and that being a more accepted way of voting um, more broadly in the country. 
um, that we might be able to address racism, uh, that there will be new leadership, and maybe that there will be actually more unity among Americans after this moment of challenge in time. Um, and that more people will actually take advantage of early voting. So those were some of the things that people shared in terms of hopes and fears. Thank you. Yeah. And I'd say you, and as is my experience in working with groups of committed people, when everyone's voice is heard, we kind of cover the waterfront. <laughs> I think we pretty much have covered what, what it, there is realism in my view in literally everything that has been said. There, there's data to suggest that we have to have our awareness honed on might there be violence related to this election. And there's reason to believe that maybe we really will produce the biggest voter turnout just to pick two, an example from each list that might be seen as the most extreme. So given who you all are, as Cheryl and I and Barbara and Judy were talking about this, I wanted to spend the next period of time talking to you about two periods of time that I think are equally important relative to the issue of trust in our democracy as it relates to the 2020 election. One period is literally the period between now and the election itself, which requires certain kinds of actions. And then the post-election, which I think will be equally, if not even more important going forward. But before I go into more detail, I, as I listened to your hopes and fears, it brought to mind at, at NICD, we had a very, very successful program with state legislators that we, we did nonpartisan, we had a workshop called Building Trust Through Civil Discourse, that over about a five year period of time, we worked deeply in 16 or 17 states, trained more than a thousand members of state legislatures, and all of them produced more bipartisan legislators afterwards, had better relationships afterwards, and NPR chose to, excuse me, PBS chose to do a highlight of the Next Generation program as an antidote, as showing us something positive that could be done about all the negative things that were happening in the country. And after about a 45 minute interview, the reporter was a woman named Susan, I don't remember her last name at the moment. You know, you could almost hear her take her name tag off and it was like a, you know, okay, Carolyn, can I ask you a personal question? I said, of course. And she said, you've been doing this for a very, very long time. She said, I really want to ask you, are you optimistic or pessimistic about what's going to happen going forward? And how I wanted to respond was just came to me in a nanosecond. And I think this is very relevant to how we all manage our internal states relative to this period now to the election and after the election. And this is what I said. If I, it's all a matter of what I pay attention to. If the majority of my attention is on the dysfunction of Congress, the president's daily tweets, social media, the barrage we receive that way, I'm very pessimistic about our capacity to turn this around. But if I pay attention, if I put more of my attention on the actions that I see individual Americans taking all over the country, which I had the option to see in my role, I am very optimistic that we will be able to right our ship again. And I think the same is true you know, I love what I just saw Patty do. I think the same is true. Wherever you sit, you can make the choice of what you pay your attention to. You know, psychologists who were seeing clients, we had a long relationship, a partnership with the American Psychological Association, and therapists were seeing people come into their offices anxious because of politics and anxious because, and they, therapists wrote contracts with people you cannot watch more than an hour of news a day. 
So that's an example where people's attention cycle was putting them in a downspin, creating anxiety in their own life. Now that's a more extreme example, but my counsel to you would be every single day, do a little, you know, a thermometer, whatever you want to call it, of making sure that you are taking in all of the positive things that are happening in your circles, in your community, and even look for it in those new sites that are producing it. Okay, so between now and the election, you know, I, I feel like this is your speech as much as mine, but what matters most is registering, still registering people and get out the vote. The Movement Voter Group, if you, or the Mover, Movement Voter Project, if you don't know the Movement Voter Project, that's a, another extraordinary effort that is ongoing. It's not the old style, we register people up till the day and then we stop. They've been working for some number of years already. But the goal, I really do believe that one of the most important steps we could take to heal our democracy and to set ourselves back in the right direction around trusting each other and our institutions is to make this the largest, most inclusive voter turnout that has ever happened in American history. That was the founding principle that we the people make the decision. And if we could collectively work to ensure that, it would be extraordinary. And I have recently, and again, in all the just continuing, whether it's climate change, whether it's vaccine or whether it's whatever, the nonsense we're hearing in national media, I'm beginning to again hear young people say, I'm disgusted with both Democrats and Republicans. I'm just not going to vote. And if young people do not vote in this election, there is no possibility of us having the largest, most inclusive turnout ever. So I think it particularly is incumbent upon all of us to think about our links with younger people in terms of where they are on their participation in this election. A lot of people are gonna to go to polls. We know that one of the things that happened in the primary, there weren't enough poll workers. There weren't enough poll watchers. Again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but I, you are the folks who can reach out way beyond your own club. We really need to start signing up people to agree to do poll work. It's really important every day to pay attention to combating misinformation about voter fraud. It's very different in different states, but pay attention in your own state. If there is the Secretary of State of Michigan, not Michigan, I, oh, Cheryl, help me, which filed a lawsuit about the post office sending a mailer that misinformed the people. Help yeah. me, somebody on the call, which state it was. But was it, um, Colorado. Colorado, that's what, yeah, Colorado. Great, thank you. So if you're a member in Colorado, now is the time to call your legislators, your local office and their national office to support the Secretary of State's lawsuit about misinformation going in a mailer to every post box. So you get my point. The drumbeat that there is fraud in this election is gonna get louder and louder and louder and louder because it provides the rationale for not accepting the results. So we don't want to wait and cry and spilt milk after the fact about how there wasn't any real voter fraud, but everybody believed there was. So now, you know, I can't say this vociferously. I've been in Maine most of the summer in a little town called Damariscotta that has a year round population of 1800 people. One of the active political clubs here is every couple of weeks staging a support march in town in support of the post office and getting people's awareness up that this post office needs our help. Did I say enough on that one? Continue to act with your member of Congress about protecting the postal service. We are not out of that battle yet either from a funding point of view or from an, a manipulation in terms of 
the number of post boxes, et cetera, et cetera. So again, pay attention to it and interact with your elected officials. One of the things I love about the young leadership of Black Lives Matters, both white and black, think how much they have been emphasizing the importance of local elections, who your judges are, who your county clerks are. And as somebody who's worked for get out the vote for as long as I have been an adult, I particularly watched in the first Obama election I went back to Cuyahoga County in Ohio where I lived and which has a huge African-American population with, in really rough times. And I went to the Democratic Party afterwards and I'm not meaning to go partisan in any place here and please accept my personal example, as a personal example. I went to party leadership and say, I helped register and brought to the polls literally a couple hundred people that will never vote again because what brought them out was an African-American running for president, unless they begin to understand the importance of all of the other lists on the ballot. So enough said. Okay, switching gears to post-election. A very sobering truth about the moment that we're living in and the reality of the divisions in our country no matter who wins this election, millions of Americans are going to believe that the system was rigged. Doesn't matter who wins. It's just gonna be a different set of people that are upset, a different set of data that they are referring to about why it wasn't fair, didn't have integrity, which means everything we've been talking about tonight means the importance of thousands of us being ready to foster one-on-one -on -one and small group conversations with people after the election, getting them as data-based as possible about what actually happened and not allowing them to stay stuck in some distorted view of what actually happened. I, I can't say, given where, how serious this has come in our country and how it's seeped into our daily lives, we've got a couple decades of work to do after this election, no matter who's elected, in terms of bringing back civility and trust and respect. So in a way that very often activism has really built up to the peak of the presidential, pace yourself right now, think through how you're gonna spend your energy so that the day after the election, you are as active and as clear about where you want your voice to be heard as possible. Maybe that's writing an op-ed piece. Maybe that's doing a podcast. Maybe that's calling a group of community leaders on different sides of the perspective in your town together to talk to each other. Have a plan. I've loved all the conversation. Have a plan about how you're gonna vote. Uh, the friend whose house I'm in today went to town hall. She's got, she requested her absentee ballot, but she walked into town hall and talked to the person there to say, has my request for this been registered? So she actually saw in the computer, it has been registered. She's going to get her ballot. So every, all this message, have a plan about your vote. My message, I think, is equally important. Have a plan of how you're going to use your voice the day after the election, regardless of who actually wins this election. The habit pattern of most Americans is to vote and stop being active. In light of the significant challenges, I mean, we're really, we, this is a moment like humanity has never seen before, particularly in its globalness. But here in this country, we have at least five existential threats to life as we have known it. Our awareness of that started with COVID, both a life death threat and a livelihood threat. That's grown to a larger economic existential threat. Black Lives Matter, or I should say George Floyd's murder and police brutality has led 
to an understanding of the pervasiveness of systemic racism that has not ever actually been held in awareness in our country. One of you mentioned, or maybe many of you mentioned, climate change. I listened to an uh, interview on NPR radio the other day in which the, in the point of interview was interviewing a climate scientist from Europe. And they were talking about the wildfires in California, and then it morphed into extreme weather events. We are still mentally, conceptually thinking of these of aberrations. And this European climate scientist paused. He let a moment of silence make his point before he spoke. And he said, just point blank, this is our weather now. And I think that then in our country, the existential threat to our very democracy, all of these are happening at exactly the same moment in time. It is essential that as many Americans as possible stay engaged post-election. Maybe it's about the election, maybe it's about climate change, maybe it's about systemic racism. I, in, in all of the disaster challenges that we're in, I'm 75 years old, and I can honestly say the election has to come out a particular way for what I'm about to say become real. But if we do cross that hurdle, there is more possibility of significant systemic change in this country on the fundamental issues than has ever been true before in my life or on the lives of any of one of you on this call. But that is only going to happen if circles of Americans stay active with shared goals across the issues and remembers that these issues all have intersections with each other. We can't get into climate change more important than systemic racism. We really have to have nodes of activity on all of them simultaneously. I probably have gone over my time. I very much appreciate you folks giving me the opportunity to have this time with you. And I'm very much looking forward to responding to more of your questions. Okay. I think we'll take just a couple of quick questions here, Barbara. What do you think? Maybe have people type into the chat. And other questions we may try to facilitate afterwards uh, if we don't get them answered. Yeah, I'm happy to. If you want to send a few to me, I'm happy to put them back in an email to you without question. It's not as much fun, but I'm willing to do it. <laughs> we did have... Um, one qu a question, and I think it's something that's on all our minds is, and you've, and you've touched on it, how do you deal with someone whose beliefs are not grounded in facts? I mean, post-election, I think this is gonna be huge. Now, currently during the election process, it's huge. Climate change, it's huge. Um, can you give us a three-step process? Listen, number one, right? <laughs> well, I, I sometimes when people ask me this question, as bad as things are about our divisions, etc., I sometimes worry most that given the way our media operates, which is what makes it possible for people to hold on so tightly to non-facts, because they're presented to them as if they're facts in from certain sources. So the issue about how we get back to a fact-based shared information, I think in some ways is as, as challenging as anything we've been talking about tonight. So I do have a couple of thoughts about it. One is in whatever area you know you're going to be doing your work, spend the time now, you, you, right now. We already know what people are going to say are the issues around election fraud. So bring together sources that are existing there every single day on election fraud. The, I'll just take that example. We are hearing statements made that are not fact-based and we are hearing good journalists 
put the facts out right behind it. So make a note of where those facts are coming from. In fact, this might be something the league wants to do, which is actually become a resource for facts on voter fraud in terms of having it up on the websites of all the state chapters. So you have both your state information and the national information. Because in the whole issue, particular fraud and mail voting, it's just, it's ridiculous. Well, listen to me. <laughs> so have your facts available and then work backwards with whomever you're talking to, to actually establish, are you willing to bring forward your source of facts I'm going to bring forward my source of facts. Let's look at both of them and then peel back the layers. And at some point, the thing that's not fact-based is going to have to hit a place where they cannot produce any data that demonstrates that. At that point, they may not shift their perspective, but you're at least in a position to say, well, it's clear to me that you are holding this belief and you are not willing to let it go but I at least hope you can see that it's not based on information. It's a belief that is important to you, but it is not based on information. It's so hard because normally fact would be a fact and now we all are operating on separate facts. Or mostly, facts. We're, op most, mostly we're operating on opinion actually. Exactly. Cheryl, maybe it's time to go into the groups at this point. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right, Barbara. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to set up a little bit of thought for the small group engagement and then I'll give a little logistics? I'd be, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd be happy to. So what we thought we'd do for our one time that you're working with each other so that it has links between you is to set up a small conversation room for you to brainstorm ideas about what you might do in your community level. And what, what we thought was important is that because we think both this period between now and the election is important and the period post-election is important, if you would note, when you get into your breakout room, some of you are going to be in odd-numbered rooms and some of you are going to be in even-numbered rooms. So what we thought could be very efficient is if all those of you who are in um, odd-numbered rooms actions, brainstorm actions that you believe you and the league could take in your community between now and the election that could have a positive impact on trust and the integrity of the election, the outcome of the election as well. All of those of you who are in even numbered rooms talk about what actions you could take after the election that could be really important and have impact Again, right back to this fundamental issue of trust and what can move our democracy back in the direction of increasing trust both in each other and institutions. So odd numbered rooms, brainstorm, actions we could take at the community level between now and the election, even, num <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, even numbered rooms, actions we could take post elections. And then when we come back together, you'll be self-facilitating facil in your small group. So share, just share your name, where you're from, and please right away choose one person who will report out a couple of the ideas that you cared the most about to all of us when we get back. So we'll at least hear a popcorn of ideas both between now and the election and post-election. And if one of the other of you was willing to jot those ideas into the chat room, even as you're producing them, then Cheryl and the team will produce a report that you'd all receive all the actions that got put into the chat room. And again, if you just put that you're odd numbered or between now and the election so she can quickly see which is which. Does that sound good? Would you like to get a list of all the ideas? <laughs> yeah. That can only happen if somebody puts them in the chat room because the way Zoom works, when you're in breakout groups, the only people that can see the chat room is you guys. So yeah. when you get put back into the plenary is when this person is going to type in as many of the ideas as they possibly can while the rest of us are talking. Yeah. Is that clear? Great. If you so, do it while you're in the chat room, we will not be able to call them back. Yeah. 
So again, as, as we just about ready to put you into the breakout rooms, uh, thank you, Carolyn, for that. You'll see a room number that will pop up as you just as you get in, you know, as you're assigned to the breakout rooms. It'll have an even number or an odd number. So one, please note that. So again, odd numbered rooms talking about between now and the election, even number talking about uh, after election. And thank you for choosing one spokesperson. And we'll give you about 10 minutes here. And then we're going to have to have a real quick report out. And then uh, just, just to keep you guys within our promised time. All right, everybody. This makes sense. Have fun, you guys. And, <laughs> we'll and see. think outside the box. Think outside the box. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. And we'll give you a heads up uh, after. During. Uh, let's see. Hey, Carolyn. Oops, you are muted. Oops, hang on. There you go. Uh, I think you're muted. Did you mute yourself intentionally? Let me see here. We've got a few people. I'm going to. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Okay, I'm going to see a few people still in our main room here. Uh, like my friend Susan. Well, for some reason, I'm having a challenge moving people, moving you guys into breakout rooms. Oops. There we go. For some reason, Janet and Susan, I can't move you into a breakout room. That usually says unassigned. I'm going to get some water, Cheryl. I'll be right okay. back. Okay, sounds good, Carolyn. Susan, here. Okay, here we go. Move to. Yep, Susan, sorry. It's not letting me move you. Oh, there you go. And Janet. I'm sorry, Janet, to keep you holding here. There we go. see if that was Oops.
Let's see. Well, Janet, do you want to have a conversation? <laughs> Oh, are there two and people? Susan, uh, yeah, Janet just wanted to observe, and Susan, did it kick you out? Screen, but she couldn't hear me or see me. I couldn't hear or see her. There were oh. just two people in the room. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Well, I guess welcome back to us. <laughs> I'm going to do just a little uh, logistic check-in on room so I can get the report out right, and maybe <laughs> Carolyn and Susan. Yeah. Can... <laughs> I'll just no. wait and see what everybody else talked about. <laughs> well, it's, it's Zoom, Zoom's breakout rooms technology, it leaves a little to be desired, but I, I haven't seen before. If, if you set it up that four or five people should be in, I haven't seen it happen. We're just two Five, six, yeah, in. exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. Where, where do you live, Susan? I'm in Michigan, uh -huh. northern uh -huh. Michigan. Whereabouts in northern Michigan? Um, Petoskey, right? Just south and west of the Mackinac Bridge. Yeah. I, I, my family, my family of origin, was, I grew up in Iowa, and we did a lot of camping in the northern peninsula, oh, including sure. Mackinac Island on occasion. I used to work when I retired from teaching. I worked on Mackinac Island, just a little part-time job. It was like a... Different world. It is a different world. <laughs> I, I haven't been there in decades, but I presume they've kept the same mm -hmm. ethos that they work so hard to create. Mm -hmm. Yep. It is important to keep some things the same. <laughs> <laughs> Traditions can be a good thing. <laughs> yep. You have a fabulous Secretary of State this round. We have a wonderful woman governor, Secretary of State, and our attorney general is also a woman, and they are wow. tremendous. I actually felt for the, your governor, what she went through in that period when COVID was so, so tough, and when the groups took over the Capitol, and rather than being acknowledged as domestic terrorists were applauded, was pretty extraordinary. We have a very, well, you know, we're a victim of um, gerrymandering. Yeah. We have our, um, you know, our governor, our um, two senators are, are um, you know, very reasonable uh, people, but we have a, because of gerrymandering, we have a very right-wing conservative legislature yeah. and that has, um, that has made things very difficult. So I assume the redistricting that passed on the ballot in 2018, that should get shifted over time. It'll take some time, but that it should will. change. Yeah. There me actually, you know, it was challenged in the courts and it was thrown out two or three times. And yeah. they, I just had an email today that they are get starting, they have the committee, the citizen bipartisan committee. Right. And Great. they're having their first meeting. So Great. I'm sad it didn't happen before this election, but we're hoping for 2022. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've been very proud of Iowa was, I think, the first state, or at least one of the very first states, to put the redistricting into a citizen commission out of the legislature and the governor's office. And they actually have had not only does it make a big difference on the state legislature, but it makes the seats in the House of Representatives in Washington very competitive rather than 
held by the same person forever. So, yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll have. I, I I totally agree with you. As depressed as I have been for the last three and a half years, I think that this has revealed our what we need to work on. Yep. There's potential yep. for a lot of growth. So, I agree. Yeah, it's only going to happen. If, it's only going to happen if we all stay active because the system, the system as it is designed is really difficult to push very far if the elected officials sitting in Washington just don't have people pushing them all the time. Right. If we back off, they'll back off. There's plenty of blame on both sides. Absolutely. There really is as far as how we got to where we are today. No question about that. Yeah. And the, to me, the, one of the ones that I've heard young people, when I mentioned hearing young people, this issue that Congress has left town without, or is clearly going to leave town without doing another COVID rescue package. And it, in terms of how the system works, it's legitimate for Democrats to say, well, they really tried. But in terms of the way most people watch politics, it's not going to be, people are just going to say both Democrats and Republicans didn't get it done. And Right, right. So, but I am encouraged by the young people. I yeah. just see so much tolerance and much more wisdom than I remember when I was their age and understanding. <laughs> we just got to make sure they vote. Exactly. Yes. And guys, we are getting close to the end of the breakouts here. Carolyn, we have only really about five more minutes, theoretically, before we're supposed to let them go. Okay. Uh, we can ask their indulgence if they want to hang a little longer. Um, yeah. Or we can, maybe we could do I'll, just... I'll do that. I'll do that at the beginning of this period. Okay. And then... Okay. Yeah. Do we take, you know, just a few report outs, a couple of, two or three yeah, from... I'd say let's take three from both now to the election and three from post three from post election. Okay. Just to give people a sense of it. And then I'll yeah. encourage people to jot as many ideas into the chat room as they can. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. And I'm thinking we do the odd numbers first, which is between now and the elections, yeah. odd number room first, and then even number three, even number room second. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm facilitating this part, right? Yep, you are. You are. Okay. Good. Yep, good. Thank you, Susan. I'm so, I'm sorry that there was only a little. There it looked like there were a couple of rooms where there were only two or three people. I'm like, I set it up for five, six, <laughs> six to seven in each room. What's going on? I thought, well, there's either <laughs> a whole lot of rooms or something went wrong. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Welcome back from your conversations, everybody. We're just waiting for folks to close their conversations. We'll be back in about 10 Anna, seconds. Will you do ours? Pardon? I just was asking Anna if she would do be our spokesperson. We didn't really choose one. Okay. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Uh, yes, Anna. We vote for Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kiddo. So now you want us to type our, uh, oh, our suggestions in the chat? Yes, yeah. People can go ahead and start typing into the chat room. Okay. Uh, let me ask your indulgence. We started a little bit late. Are folks willing to go over about five or six or seven minutes here? Sure. Is that okay? Sure. So here's what I would suggest. We won't be able to take data from all of the subgroups, all of the breakout groups. So please do somebody in the group, get them into the chat room. So let's start with the uh, odd numbered rooms. And in terms of keeping it to about five or six minutes, how about if we do three, three breakout rooms and tell us what you came up with in your brainstorm ideas? And whatever hand I see first, I will call on. 
William, are you raising your hand? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, William. Not intentionally. I was trying to type. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll let you keep typing. We want you to type. Who's an odd-numbered room? That would be Di, one. Di has her hand raised. Pardon? Di has her hand raised. Okay, go. I have to unmute. Um, I was in, uh, we were in uh, a group number 13, uh -huh. and um, two, we, two of the, the things that we came up with is when we see something, we say something on social media. If we see misinformation on social media, we try and fact check it and link it with something factual. Great. Um, and then another one I thought was really great was um, how to get out the youth vote. And the suggestion was that we act like aunts, moms, grandmas, and if neighbors, you know, if there's a, a young voter in our purview or for black Americans, the younger black Americans too, uh, who, who think that Republicans and Democrats are all the same and they don't want to vote, just counsel them, get them to vote and, and get them to commit to finding a friend or two to also vote, you know, just just act like moms, aunts, and grandmas, and great aunts, and whatever. So great those were our ideas. Thank you, Dee. Two okay. great ideas. Somebody else in an odd-numbered group like to report. Joan Smith has her hand up. Great. <laughs> no, I was just typing in all of these things, so I, I wanted to share. <laughs> Uh, Lori and I, Lori's from New York, opposite sides of the country, but um, we talked about the fact that we both organizations had multilingual uh, posters and flyers to be able to distribute to key places around our community. Great. And uh, one of the places that I've discovered that I'm going to try to hit a little harder is to take it into the district offices of the schools and uh, ask them to distribute it to the uh, copy and distribute to the seniors. And uh, I think the flyer will, it has the skew on for voter registration. So the kids can just use their cameras on their phones and just uh, go directly to the website on the uh, computer for registration if they're eligible or even if they're pre-eligible, which we allow to do in this state. Um, the other uh, thing that I've talked about a little bit is um, we had a Braver Angels uh, uh, forum that we, uh, you, we set up at the end of August in anticipation of all of the, you know, be, trying to, to meet heads and talking to people. And um, it was wonderful. It was uh, very well received and, uh, uh, it was basically a training for communication tools for bridging the, the political divide is what it was. And it was, um, they are very polished and I highly recommend that if you have a lot of contention within your uh, community because they do a marvelous job. And it's only $12 to join the organization and they do so many things. They have book talks and a whole variety of things that you can, uh, share with with your community and uh, on the civil discourse issue. Um, so those were the main things that we had discussed. There was we had a, a, a only three people in our group, and one was on the phone, and we never heard from them. Although they're they're um, they they showed up, so I'm I'm not sure what they would have said, and I'm hope I'm I'm sharing what uh, they would have liked to say at that point. Thank you, Joan. I'm really glad you mentioned Braver Angels because actually their website is another great resource. Even if you, I agree with you that they're a wonderful resource to bring to your community, but even using their website for their tools. Another one is out of Cambridge, Massachusetts called Essential Partners. They have excellent resources right up on their website about how to structure these conversations for a difficult conversation. How about one more person from an odd room? Hey, Carolyn, I see Deb Humphreys has a great one, and she was in an uh, odd room. Deb, would you be willing to share verbally? Unmute yourself. Got to unmute yourself, Deb. All right. 
Hi okay. there. Good job. Yeah, I think the, the key theme was, uh, please, let's use our young, our young folks that are eligible to, to vote and also to get out there and help with the polls. I think that they may be less concerned about the COVID thing than those of us my age are. And, uh, and also, um, okay, I've got three different sets of notes here. <laughs> Uh, and just and help dispel the myth that you'll get immediate results on election night. I think that that came out loud and clear yeah. as well. We have to help prepare people for that because how many people stay up and, and have party and wait for those big results? So reframing uh, how we're going to get the news might help as well. That's really good. I've been really pleased to see that the major outlets, the journalists are beginning to talk about they need to cover the election differently that night. So exactly. as not to feed into that expectation as they always do. Well, thank you very much for the what to do between now and the election. And I think you picked up on some really significant ideas. So let's go to a few in even numbered groups about your ideas for post-election. All right, I see. Yeah, Patty. I see Petty, Petty Van Riekum. Riekum. Yes. Okay, so we had, we had a very interesting conversation. I, I put some notes already in the chat, but I've got my paper version here. Uh, the, the one thing that we said, the, the most important thing right after the election is to don't gloat and don't be depressed. So we thought we would start with that <laughs> That's one. That's great. That's great. <laughs> okay. Excellent. And then, and then we felt like um, moving forward that find one of those existential threats that you're interested in or your league is interested in and, and work on that. That was another thing. Another suggestion was obviously to have uh, and sponsor more civil discourse programs, bringing a diverse people together and, and also do whatever you can within your community to build community, to bring people together. And then, then last, and this was my out of the box kind of thing, Carolyn, is I, I, from my experience, I feel like in order to have a really good conversation where you're just giving them your views on things, I really feel that people first need to understand what their worldview is, where it came, what the, were the life experiences that made, made them have those views and what others are. And so I am proposing an educational game that would give people that information. It's a great idea. Anytime you can come up with a social structure that gets the conversation to the right level, that's a real gift to people. Who else in an even numbered room would like to share? And I wanna also underline the notion of your own emotional reaction the day after. You are gonna have it and particularly if you need to gloat, do it in the morning while you're brushing your teeth and then get rid of it because that will only exacerbate the continued division. Mm -hmm. Who else in an even numbered room? Yes, Anna, please. All righty. Um, echoing some of the previous ones, we um, thought we would focus primarily on the middle groups, those willing participants. And then we also talked about um, bringing in trusted experts. Um, we had had a board of elections chair speak with us today. And so then the other ladies in the group suggested taking that same recording that we did and using it after the fact to kind of great, show great. how things w did go as they were supposed to go. That's a great um, idea. Also to um, offer for post-election conversations uh, with titles such as how do you stay engaged in healing? How do we all stay engaged in the healing of our country? Or are you feeling weary? How can we create optimism by doing something positive? Um, and just basically building on that notion of uh, what is civility and how we Excellent. talk. To Excellent. Your, your thought about the Board of Elections expert being widely speaking before the election and then after the election. That's a great yes. idea. Great idea. I love their idea. Thank you. We yeah. will do it. Super. Carolyn, Irene Epp has her hand up. Oh, it's the same group. Same group because oh, I love okay. that idea so much about the <laughs> election. All right. One more even numbered group. 
who's willing to put out your what your group came up with? Going once, going twice. Does, doesn't the thumb up mean something? Oh, I'm, I missed it, William. Perfect. The thumb up is perfect. We should have said use the thumb up. Go for it. Okay. So uh, we started out a little with expressing some concern about things, obviously, uh, sharing our concerns. But then we talked about what, how to document after the election is over. Uh, I really like that idea of having the Board of Elections speak. But we talked about documenting on our, our Facebook, our website, about uh, factual data from the election and comparing it to other elections, okay. uh, how many polling stations were open, how many people voted, how long the delays were, uh, how many people did mail-in versus absentee, well, Pennsylvania's absentee ballots, but mail-in, absentee, and in-person voting, um, and, and trying to uh, show where the trends were going terms of, of the vote in, you know, in each of our own districts, our own counties or whatever. Uh, and yeah, yeah. then to continue a plans of action on, on all the other important issues for us, like uh, racial injustice, climate, uh, climate issues and so forth. Excellent. Being prepared to put out all that comparative data about in a particular jurisdiction is a really, really valuable thing to do in terms of putting the facts out quickly relative to the kind of myths that are going to get going. Definitely. Well, you guys have been great. I really appreciate, Judy, the invitation to be with you. And I think I'm turning it back to you. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Karen, Barbara, for helping us to learn how to improve our listening skills and for sharing with us what we can do before and after the election to strengthen our relationships. It'll be interesting for sure. Um, as Cheryl said, this program was recorded and will be posted on the Wheaton League's website and the Illinois League's website. Um, please join us next month, October 15, at 7 p.m. for another interesting program. Um, Peter Adams will be talking about fighting against fake news, the case for news literacy, as Barb had mentioned previously. And good night, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Carolyn and Cheryl. Oh, thank you, Carolyn and Cheryl. Definitely my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Barbara, thank you. Judy, and everybody. Thank you. It was Stay a positive. great evening. Thank you. All right. Good night, all. Good night. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody.